Good evening, everyone. I'm Jonathan Capehart, in for Joy Reid. And we begin tonight just six days from the start of the new Congress. Republican leader Kevin McCarthy faces a vote for Speaker of the House next Tuesday with a razor-thin Republican majority and the very real prospect of an open fight over the gavel. It's a predicament underscored by the saga of incoming Republican Congressman George Santos of New York, who again tried to explain away lies about his biography in an interview with Fox News. Do you have no shame in the people well, who are now you're asking to trust you to go and be their voice for them, their families and their kids in Washington? Tulsi, I can say the same thing about the Democrats and, and the party. The better question is, does Kevin McCarthy have any shame or will he just continue to ignore the admitted fraud about to join his ranks in his desperate pursuit of the speaker's gavel? McCarthy has been silent as Santos has admitted to numerous false claims, likely because Santos has said Republicans must support McCarthy's bid to become speaker. Highlighting the fact that extremists now control this Republican caucus in chaos? Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's emerged as one of Kevin McCarthy's most vocal backers. She defended Santos. She said Republicans should give him the chance to legislate. The same Marjorie Taylor Greene, who was kicked off committees for promoting anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, defends speaking at white nationalist conferences, and according to January 6th committee transcripts released Tuesday, former White House aide Cassidy Hutchinson recalled Greene bragging to her and then Chief of Staff Mark Meadows about QAnon supporters, many of them her constituents, coming to Washington that day. Hutchinson, reveal, Hutchinson said Green gave Donald Trump a similar spiel, showing a constituent wearing a Q shirt and telling the former president, those are all my people. But with Republicans fighting among themselves at every turn, Kevin McCarthy's quest for power has opened a rift even among the extremists. Matt Gates, one of five House Republicans who have vowed to vote against McCarthy, told The Daily Caller why. I'm not voting for Kevin McCarthy for speaker because I think he's just a shill of the establishment. And the reason most of my Republican colleagues are supporting him is because they benefit from the redistribution of lobbyist and special interest money through McCarthy to their campaign accounts. Joining me now, Matthew Dowd, founder of Country Over Party and chief strategist for the Bush-Cheney 2004 presidential campaign. Eugene Scott, national political reporter at The Washington Post. And Dana Milbank, columnist for The Washington Post and author of The De Deconstruction Destructionists. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dana. The 25-year crack up of the Republican Party. Thank you all very much coming to the readout. Eugene, since you're sitting here with me on set, I'm going to start with you. Put the Never Kevin chaos into perspective. Explain why McCarthy has been so, so silent on Santos. Well, primarily because Santos has been vocal about his support for McCarthy, and McCarthy's not in a position where he can afford to lose any votes. He is not at a place right now where he has enough support from his own party to secure the speakership. And so why push back on someone who has already told him that they are going to support him? Mm -hmm. And I just want to point out that, you know, NBC News has reached out to the National Republican Cong Congressional Committee, leader Kevin mm -hmm. McCarthy, whip Steve Scalise, uh, conference chair Elise Stefanik for their reactions to, to Santos admitting embellishments, I call them lies, uh, and calls for his resignation. Um, they, we have not, heard, have not received any responses, so just want to put that out there. You know, Matthew, what does it say about the Republican Party that this is where it is right now, that there's a person who's running for speaker, who is so desperate to become speaker that you've got a QAnon supporting extremist who is saying everyone must vote for him. And meanwhile, he's staying silent on a guy who has been revealed to be to have lied repeatedly about his own background, staying silent on all of this, all in the hopes of securing the magical 218. Well, I think what we've seen, and as everybody I know on this panel has watched, is they don't hold anybody accountable. Uh, the Republican Party establishment and the Republican Party leadership hold no one. I mean, they watched Donald Trump, according to the Washington Post, lie some some 30,000 times, never held him accountable in the course of that. I mean, in the end, it's all about power in this. I think Kevin McCarthy recognizes that Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene 
are probably much closer to the center of where the Republican voters in this country are uh, than any sort of mainstream Republicans that are left in leadership or left in that are left as elected officials. Just keep in mind, Jonathan, if you look at almost every single statewide key contest in key races, whether it's Pennsylvania, Michigan, Arizona, Nevada, Georgia, nearly every one of those for Republicans, the Republican voters nominated election-denying, conspiracy theory, anti-democratic candidates. Not in five, not in six, in nearly every single race. And so this is a problem. Obviously, it's coming to fruition in this leadership battle, but it's really a problem because, the, as I say, the center of the Republican Party, this is where the center of the Republican Party is and the voters are. And that's why people like Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy, who want to have a linkage with the establishment or some part of the mainstream, mm -hmm. are really out of sync with where Republican primary voters are. And Dana, you know, I know I, I mess up the name of your book. It's called The, De De Destru the Destructionists. And you were writing about uh, Newt Gingrich and his revol Republican revolution uh, at the time. But these folks who are ruling the roost in this current Republican majority are quite some characters. Um, uh, there are six people who are, are opposed to Kevin McCarthy uh, right now being speaker. And Kevin McCarthy can only lose, I think, four of them if, if he wants to become speaker. But what's interesting here is, of those six, two of them requested pardons after January 6th. Andy Biggs and Matt, oh, and Matt Gates. Also in there is Marjorie Taylor Greene, and she's voting for Kevin McCarthy. Um, also, Marjorie Taylor Greene was caught on tape saying that if she had planned uh, January 6th, that she would have been successful and her, her people would have been armed. I, mm -hmm. I, I'm just, you've written about Kevin McCarthy and, and what's happened with yeah. his quest for, for the speakership. But put all of this into the historical context. How far has the Republican Party slid from the destructionists of Newt Gingrich to these jokers? Right. It's just been uh, iteration after iteration of this uh, deterioration. So, you know, 1994, uh, the Tea Party wave, the Trump wave, uh, and so on. You know, I, I don't often get to say this, so let me say that I agree uh, with Matt Gates. He, he called uh, Kevin McCarthy, Kevin McCarthy, that he'll cave into anything, that he has no ideology. And that, of course, is exactly uh, the issue. He stands for nothing but ambition. Uh, so this is, you know, old-fashioned coalition politics. It used to be, yeah, you know, you'd get some uh, Southerners to uh, mix with some Midwesterners and you'd put things together. Now you've got uh, the insurrectionists, you've got the white nationalists, you've got the QAnon folks, you've got the anti-Semites, uh, and you've got whatever uh, fabulous what uh, uh, George Santos is. That's your coalition and you have to keep them together. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it's showing itself because the first vote is going to be on uh, the Speaker of the House. But if and when Kevin McCarthy is elected, he's going to have no ability to get the second vote through or the third vote through because it's this same coalition of craziness that he has to put together. Uh, and that has been building. Uh, the, the extremism uh, was built upon in election after election uh, mm -hmm. when the most extreme candidate won. And this is sort of the inevitable result of that. Mm -hmm. And Matthew, speaking of, we're looking at on Tuesday the prospect of the f first time in since the 1800s, if memory serves, that a speaker will have to will have gone through ballot after ballot after ballot after ballot in order to get the speaker's gavel. And I'm wondering already, Kevin McCarthy seems weak. How weak and how damaging is that, not just to the Republican conference, but to, to the country? If a Speaker McCarthy comes in, he gets the gavel, but it took him five, six, 30 ballots in order to get the gavel. Well, I mean, I'm going to, something that Dana just said that I'll just carry on because I goes to think it goes to this conversation, which is for a guy that's completely craven. And you know, all he wants is to be in, be sit in the speaker's office. That's really fundamentally what he's always wanted and wants. 
He's never put together a sort of a, a an effort or a vision of how, how he wants to govern and what he wants to do on behalf of the country. That has not interested him. So I think he's like a, you know, a, a, a circus leader that just wants to bring in, you know, the bearded lady and a wall, whatever, and have a series of Barnum and Bailey performance thing, as long as every morning he can get up and take the black car into the Capitol, go to the speaker's office, take the black car back and leave home. It's they're not going to get anything done. It's going to be a continued round of, as I say, circus acts in the middle of this. And so I, I, how long he is able to maintain his ability to sit in that chair, I think, is a question mark. Because all he needs to do along the way is, as was stated, is lose four or five votes, and they basically say you're done in the midst of this. But I think see, Speaker McCarthy doesn't have some agenda that he's worried about pushing through. He just wants to sit in the chair.